This is the Nairobi Ideas Podcast, a podcast that gives a public platform to the Africans changing the world with their big ideas. I'm your host, Kare Mugo of the Mawazo Institute. For this episode of the podcast, we're going to be bringing you something a little bit different, short stories from scientists. Normally, when we hear science, we don't think of storytelling. Personally, I'm usually picturing some super serious lab code scientist who's working day and night to find a cure to some really hard to understand tropical disease, or else I'm picturing a scientist who is also in a lab code just trying to figure out how, you know, nanoparticles can conduct electricity or how to get us to space in the shortest amount of time. But I would argue that the field of science actually shares many commonalities with storytelling. And I'm not saying this just because I'm a storyteller myself, but I do think that science is a form of storytelling, right? It involves a theme, there's usually a character, there's a plot, there's a setting, all the elements you need to tell a really good story. Science has them. In this episode of the podcast, we're going to be bringing you some documentary stories from four scientists who are living in Nigeria, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. Their work is at the front lines of Africa's COVID-19 response. But that's not why we invited them to the podcast. We wanted to hear about their experiences with the pandemic, not just as researchers or as scientists, but as individuals, as Africans, as mothers, as wives, employees who are adjusting to working from home, as students who are really dealing with the uncertainty of what COVID-19 means. We also wanted to hear about their COVID-19 scares and fears. And really in this episode, we're looking past the research and taking a personal look at what it means to live through the pandemic as Africans. Let's meet our storytellers. Dr. Blessings Kaunda is a Malawian social scientist. She's a medical anthropologist and an honorary researcher at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. Blessings is part of a team that is contributing to science policy engagement to support evidence-informed policy responses to COVID-19 in Africa. She acts alongside stakeholders inside and outside government machinery to help get multiple perspectives, strategies, and responses that can inform and enhance pandemic response. My fellow Africans, it was all over BBC, CNN, and Sky News. The West reported that they would see dead bodies piled in the streets in African cities and villages because of COVID-19. The scientists and doctors looked at our bodies and assumed those who weighed heavier and had comorbidities or underlying conditions such as asthma, HIV, TB, cancer would die early. I was scared helpless and hopeless. It made me think twice as I'm asthmatic and I was afraid I would die soon. I thought of my immediate and extended family and continued to fear for their lives. I remembered my mom and dad as they are living with diabetes. Both my personal and professional lives were shattered. I've always tried to live my life to the fullest and achieve the best in my personal and professional life. I love spending time with friends, attending parties with 20 or more people, brying meat, drinking water, and nibbling on meat and fruit snacks, participating in church and activities with 50 plus people, ushering people in and out of church is my passion visiting and walking around the mega malls, eating out and buying groceries with my hubby and two girls is part of our daily and weekend life. Professionally, I needed to continue researching and interviewing people for my research work. But by March, 2020, my outgoing lifestyle came to a total standstill. Imagine I stopped going out of my home I stopped visiting my friends and family, going to the shops or church, including working in my office. I ended up spending nine months enclosed in my house with my husband and two girls. I stayed in the house 24 hours and ensured that I met my school and research needs. My husband was the only one who went out, 
sporadically to replenish our food stocks and materials. Imagine my husband had to buy pads and cotton wool for me. I continued to prepare single and the only meal for the day to maintain our health bodies. We agreed no more pap, no more potatoes and dairy food. We needed to keep lean and healthy. Homeschooling for the five working days was part of the everyday duties, coupled with a few exercise routines to keep ourselves fit. It was not easy. On the professional side, I had to manage a study on attitudes and perceptions of mandatory use of face masks as a preventive measure during the COVID-19 pandemic in a district in Zomba, Malawi. A written research report on the Zomba study and contributions to a manuscript for publication is on the way. We can't have both worlds in terms of achieving professionally as well as personally. Here I am in October, 2021. I survived the first, second, and third wave of COVID-19 pandemic. Living with asthma and being heavyweighted is not a death sentence after all. Glory be to God. Thank you. Gugule Tutarakini is a Zimbabwean ecologist and a wildlife conservationist who works with RESA, a Zimbabwean preservation and conservation organization. Guguleti's work explores how COVID-19 is influencing people's perceptions towards wildlife and tourism. She says that as outbreaks of animal-borne illnesses are expected to become even more frequent among humans, we have to ensure that biodiversity conservation is factored into responses to these outbreaks. So it was the March of 2020 when the lockdown of Zimbabwe was announced. It was actually the first lockdown and um, we had never seen anything like that. So for me, really, I was excited to go and work home. Um, it, was, it meant time with family. And also because I hadn't seen anyone sick with COVID, I hadn't had any of my neighbors sick. We didn't really see anyone sick. It was really far from us. We had only seen this on television. So that's why we were really excited to go and be with family at home. So we changed and shifted our timetables and working from home until this afternoon when we were just going about our normal duties that I saw my husband do something very unusual of him. He went and had a nap in the afternoon. I mean, this is the kind of person who is so hardworking, he's so physical, you have to convince him to rest. It takes a lot of convincing for him to go on holiday. And if he has a leave at work, he will be going out to do some consultation work or he's for academics, nothing like going home just to rest. So it was really concerning. So I followed him and asked him what was happening. And he gave me the three sentences. I'm feeling weak. I think there's something in my chest and I'm having lots of breath. I mean, when he finished those three sentences, I felt my temperature really rise so high. I felt so hot, felt so weak, and I could feel these sharp pains in my stomach. I tried really to act normal, and I asked him if he could go to the doctor, which he agreed so fast and was so unusual of him, which actually increased the pressure and the fear in me. So we went out to look for a surgery that was open, and all of them were closed except for one, which attended to us from the door. And when they had those three symptoms that he had, they refused to let us in and directed us to the provincial hospital. And now I tell you, my temperature was almost at boiling point with fear because for me, it felt like the doctor was also saying, this is beyond us, this is death, there is no other way out. So we went back home feeling even more paralyzed, more stressed, and more rejected and dejected. When we got home, I opened my cupboard and took all the help out that we had and made one huge scary concoction that looked so poisonous. And I forced him to drink it. And after 20 minutes and 30 minutes, I was checking on him. And when I was asking him, how was he feeling? 
he only told me that now his stomach also is painful. And now I got even more hopeless and more scared. So if all this is happening, the day is progressing and it's becoming darker and darker. And that means I'll be even more alone with him and the kids. So when night came and I was monitoring him, I could see that his health was really deteriorating and he was even struggling more to breathe and he was clearing his throat more times. And I felt even more and more scared. I couldn't sleep. Even as, if, even if I was so tired, exhausted from the day's activities and trying to run around and get some help, I couldn't close my eyes. I was so scared. What if I sleep and he dies in his sleep? So I sat there on, on, on my bed, alone in the middle of the night, just waiting, and these many thoughts started to bombard my mind. What if he dies? What am I going to do? What am I going to say to these two children? Well, where am I going to start? And what am I supposed to do? I felt so scared. I felt so alone. And at that moment in time, that's when I realized the intensity of COVID-19. I understood what people were begging. And I realized that we had not been more empathetic. We had not been more helpful. We had not been more understanding. When the morning came, it was the most beautiful morning of all my life because he was still alive. And he was so excited to realize it was only an allergic creation. Otherwise, he was fine. Thank you. Yolanda Kalashe is a South African statistician who is working on a project to improve communication strategies among health and government officials who need to communicate all kinds of COVID-19 information to the public. Yolanda is helping to fight the infodemic by using microblog data and Twitter to study how information in South Africa is spread on social media. Her research is going to help government and health officials build risk communication strategies that are geared for a social media world. The year was 2020. The month was February. I had a lot of milestones which were happening in my life. I was officially employed. Um, my grad year was officially over. This was my year to showcase my skills, both in leadership as well as my work. I had also decided to go back to school and obtain my master's degree. This was an exciting month indeed. I remember going into campus to fetch my student card, the excitement that I had, the excitement in the eyes of the other students uh, combined with nervousness as well. I also remember the excitement in the other grads' uh, faces that were also full-time employed now. I felt like the world was my oyster. I was ready to conquer it. But then March hit, and there was whispers around the floor around a pandemic. There was whispers that a group of South Africans had um, contacted uh, this COVID. And it was heard that this might spread across South Africa. Everyone was uneasy. We were still going to the office. However, the varsities were still open. No one was saying anything. The communication was silent. This was excruciating. Finally, in the last week of March, straight after payday, we were told that the company was going to do a staggered approach in terms of people working from home and some people working to the office, but there was no word from the varsity still. A week later, the president made an announcement that we are going on a hard lockdown. So this meant that the staggered approach that our company was talking about was null and void. Our university reached out stating that everything would be virtual. Our company, however, was still a bit silent. I had always dreamt of this day where I would be working from home, doing everything at home, living my best life, I thought. I'd be more flexible, but this was not the case. It lasted for about two weeks, the excitement, when the company was still trying to adjust to working virtually. Then they finally somehow adjusted towards the end of April. And that's when things escalated. You could sense that our superiors were uneasy having their staff working at home, not knowing whether they were going to work or chill by their poolside. 
our timelines shortened, our book of work increased because of this. We had daily meetings, back-to-back -back meetings from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And we wondered when will we achieve our deliverables when we're always in meetings. My exams are also starting to creep up. But as stated, I was excited and happy to ensure that my career had an exponential growth. And I was aiming to pass with a first in my academics. I am an overachiever after all. I have always been since I was in high school. Because of this, I had to put on a brave face. Whenever people asked how I am, I would always echo the word fine, but I knew deep down I was not fine. I remember I had just wrote an exam that took me literally about 24 hours to complete, even though they stated that it would be about eight hours. I started the exam at 8 a.m. and submitted at 6.30 a.m. the following day. I had two hours to nap and get to my working career. No one understood because the only people that knew was my best friend and partner and the rest of the world thought I was fine and everything was going okay. But I was experiencing anxious symptoms. There was periods of time where my neck felt like it was bloated. Whenever I would think of everything that I needed to be done, my throat would throb. I would fight in my head, telling myself, I can't do this. But then my other side of my head will be like, no, we have to push. This is what we need to do. But through it all, I surprised myself. I passed with a fist. And during a period where people were worried about their jobs, I was promoted to manage a team, a project team. Even though deep down, I somewhat knew I had the mental capacity and my mentally, I was strong and I could adapt well to change. But this did not give me the right to abuse my mind and body the way that I did. I need to have boundaries going forward. Thank you. Miracle Eunice Bolurunduro is a Nigerian medical sociologist who is studying the social causes and consequences of health and illness. Miracle Eunice's current research on COVID-19 is exploring the perceptions, knowledge, attitudes, and care-seeking behavior of Nigerians in Ondo State in Southwest Nigeria. Alongside Miracle Eunice's ongoing research, she's also sensitizing communities in Southwest Nigeria about how COVID-19 is spread and how to prevent it. Schools had just reopened and life as we know it was getting back to normal when the third wave of the pandemic hit in Nigeria. I'd had a long week in school trying to catch up for the last time when schools were shut. It was the weekend and I was on my way home when I felt fatigued like I haven't in a long time. But I attributed it to the, to the stress of the week. I felt when I rested, I'll get better. But I didn't get better. It only got worse. It went from just fatigue to aches all over my body, to a fever, and then to nausea and cough. And these symptoms are re closely related to that of COVID or the virus. And then I went into full panic mode. Prior to this time, I had not considered entertaining the thought of contracting the virus. Not because I took all precautions, but I just believed I had this faith that I couldn't. But at this very particular time, I had been exposed to students who had just resumed, who had been all over the country and interacted with all sorts of persons. And so I felt that I might have contracted the virus. I communicated my symptoms to my family and they all they also got worried that I, I might have contracted the virus. And then consciously, unconsciously, they began to isolate me. My elder sister, whom I spend most part of my weekends with, told me not to come so as not to expose herself and her family to the risk of contracting the virus. And as at this time, nothing had been ascertained. I felt bad, I felt ostracized because this is my, my family is a very close-knit one. We are closer than the normal family. But these are people who I expected to be with me, to be there for me in this very trying time. But I think the need for self-preservation just kicked in and they felt they needed to give me their distance. 
I had no doubt prior to this that my family loved me. They have shown up for me in ways I could ex ever express. But one that comes readily to mind was at a time where, as a family, I had so many expenses that year. But they still went ahead to book a, a flight for me. I was the only member of the family at that time who had not traveled by air. And it came as a surprise and I was so overwhelmed. The time too, I needed help in getting some data. And they went out of their way to ensure I got that data for the research work I was doing then. So I'll just mention a few of the many things they had done. Why couldn't they be there for me at this time? Well, eventually I got better. It wasn't COVID, it was just a flu. And I was never more grateful to be alive because I felt that perhaps if I actually contracted the virus, my family would have moved on. I have no doubt that they loved me. I came to the realization that people whom you love, your significant others, be they family or friends, may not always be there for you in the ways you expect them to be. And in those times, when they are not there for you, you need to find inner strength to move on. You need to find inner strength to strive to live because life is beautiful. Thank you. To find out more about our guests, find links to information shared in this episode, or to listen again, you can find us permanently on the Nairobi Ideas podcast page at moazoinstitute.org backslash podcast. You can also subscribe to the Nairobi Ideas podcast on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. The Nairobi Ideas podcast is brought to you by the Mawazo Institute, a Nairobi-based research organization that is focused on female thought leadership and public engagement with research. New episodes drop once a week on Thursdays. Till then, from all of us here at Mawazo Institute, bye and keep it nerdy.